I haven't been uncomfortable. You know, I haven't really been scared like yeah. I thought I might be. Um, you know, there's always questions of asylum and, you know, where I'm going to stay and how these things work out. But uh, regardless of what happens, if I, uh, <laughs> if I end up in chains in Guantanamo, um, I can live with that. Are you happy in Russia or would you much rather be in Western Europe or back in the States? You know, I'm, I'm much happier here in Russia uh, than I would be facing an unfair trial in which I can't, uh, I can't even present a public interest defense to a jury of my peers. We've uh, asked the government again and again to provide for a, a fair trial and they've declined. Um, and I, I feel very fortunate to have received uh, asylum. I've been totally open about the fact that I disapprove of the majority of the recent laws in Russia on internet censorship and surveillance. I think it's entirely inappropriate for any government in any country to insert itself into the regulation of a free press. Uh, how good is your Russian? Give us a sentence in Russian so we can test your <laughs> I think I'm going to avoid that online because the last thing I want is float, uh, clips of me <laughs> speaking Russian floating around the internet out of context. <laughs> you feel as if you're under surveillance? I think it's reasonable to assume that I am under surveillance. Uh, anyone in my position um, surely is subject to some surveillance. But you take the precautions you can to make sure that uh, even if you are under surveillance, there's no sensitive information for you to expose. You, you might not have the documents, uh, but you've got all this knowledge in your head. If I were providing information that I know that's in my head to some foreign government, the U.S. intelligence community would be able to detect that. They would see changes in the type of information that's going through it. They would see sources go dark that were previously productive. They would see new sources of disinformation appearing within these channels. And that hasn't happened. Did you read the book about you by Edward Lucas, who works for The Economist, which claims essentially that you're a Russian spy? No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. He's crazy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's, he's not credible at all. I mean, the claim is that this has got the Kremlin's fingerprints all over it, and that if you're not actually a spy, you're an unwitting agent of Russia. I can give a blanket response to all of the Russia questions. If the government had the, the tiniest indication, the tiniest shred of evidence, that not even that I was working for the Russian government, that I was associating with the Russian government, it would be on the front page of the New York Times by lunchtime. Knowing what we know now, what is the responsibility of professionals to change their behavior if they're dealing with sensitive information? I mean, journalists must know that if they carry a mobile phone on the way to meet a source, that's going to be compromised. The work of journalism has become immeasurably harder than it ever has been in the past. Um, journalists have to be particularly conscious about any sort of network signaling, any sort of connection, any sort of license plate reading uh, device that they pass on their way to a meeting point, any place they use their credit card, any place they take their phone, any email contact they have with the source. Because that very first contact before encrypted communications are established is enough to give it all away. What other forms of professionals should be changing their behavior as a result of what we now know? It's a constantly increasing list, and one that we're not even aware of today. I would say lawyers, doctors, uh, investigators, possibly even accountants. Anyone who has an obligation to protect the privacy interests of their clients is facing a new and challenging world, uh, and we need new professional training and new professional standards to make sure that we have mechanisms to ensure that the average member of our society can have a reasonable me measure of faith in the skills of all the members of these professions. It is, is technology compatible with privacy? Absolutely. Uh, technology can actually increase privacy, but not if we sleepwalk into new applications of it without uh, considering the implications of these new technologies. The question is, why are our private details that are transmitted online? Uh, why are our private details that are stored on our personal devices any different 
than the details and private records of our lives that are stored in our private journals. There shouldn't be this, this distinction between digital information and printed information. But the government uh, in the United States, the government in the United Kingdom, and many other countries around the world is increasingly seeking to make that distinction because they, uh, they recognize that it vastly increases their, their powers of investigation. People use the analogy of the haystack and the needle that you need to collect all this information in order to look for the needle of specific intelligence that you're looking for. I would argue that simply using the term haystack is misleading. This is a haystack of human lives. It's all the private records of the most intimate activities throughout our lives that are aggregated and compiled and stored for increasing frequencies of time. It may be that by seizing all of the records of our private activities, by watching everywhere we go, by watching everything we do, by monitoring every person we meet, by analyzing every word we say, by waiting and passing judgment over every association we make and every person we love, that we could uncover a terrorist plot or we could discover more criminals. But is that the kind of society we want to live in? That is the definition of a security state. When did you last read 1984? <laughs> uh, actually, quite some time ago. Uh, contrary to uh, popular belief, you know, I, I don't think we are exactly in the 1984 universe. The technologies that are in 1984 now seem unimaginative and quaint. You know, nowadays we actually buy uh, cell phones that are the equivalent of a, a networked microphone that we carry around in our pockets with us voluntarily uh, as we go from place to place and move about our lives. Uh, 1984 is an important book, but we should not bound ourselves to the limits of the author's imagination. You know, our times have shown that the world is much more unpredictable and dangerous than that. Do you think this is the end of cloud computing? I don't. I think what cloud companies need to pursue in order to be truly successful is uh, what's called a, a zero knowledge system, which means the service providers host and process uh, content on behalf of customers, but they don't actually know what it is. That's the only way they can prove to the customers that they can be trusted with their information. What's a good example of that? There's a company called Spider Oak. Spider Oak is a competitor to Dropbox, but Dropbox is a uh, targeted, you know, mm. wannabe Prism partner. Uh, they just put, uh, I believe, Connolly's Rice on their board on the of board directors, board. Yeah, who is probably the most anti-privacy official you can imagine. So they're they're very hostile to privacy. Spider Oak, in response, has structured their system in such a way you can store all of your information on them, but they literally have no access to the content of that information. So while, yeah, they could be compelled to turn it over, you know, the law enforcement agencies still have to go to a judge and get a warrant to actually get your encryption key from you. Do you use Google? <laughs> no. No? Do you I use, don't use Google. Do you use Skype? <laughs> no. I have used Skype and Google Hangouts. Uh, which are great, but unfortunately security compromised services uh, for public talks where they've been required, but I wouldn't use it for personal communications. We shouldn't trust them without verifying what their activities are, how they're using our data, and deciding for ourselves whether it's appropriate where they draw the lines. So you're, you're sitting there inside the NSA, you're a young man, all these doubts are crowding in. Do you think other analysts had the same doubts? Was this something where you ever shared your doubts? Absolutely. I mean, the reality of working in an intelligence community is that you see things that are deeply troubling uh, all the time. And it's not just one person, it's many of them. Uh, so I raised concerns about these programs regularly and widely, more than 10 discrete colleagues uh, that I had worked with. Uh, and that's both laterally and vertically in my work. I went to and I showed these programs. I said, what do you think about this? Isn't this unusual? How can, how can we be doing this? Isn't this unconstitutional? Isn't this a violation of rights? You're, you're talking about patterns of behavior. Just to rephrase the question, were, were there specific, specific things where you, where you actually felt? 
uneasy that X was being targeted all a the simple, time. A simple example that everybody can uh, relate to is you've got young enlisted guys, 18 to 22 years old. Uh, they've suddenly been thrust into a position of extraordinary responsibility where they now have access to all of your private records. Now, in the course of their daily work, they stumble across something that is completely unrelated to uh, their work in any sort of necessary sense. For example, uh, an intimate uh, nude photo of someone in a sexually compromising situation, but they're extremely attractive. So what do they do? They, they, they turn around in their chair and they show their coworker. And their coworker has says, oh, hey, that's great. Send that to Bill down the way. Uh, and then Bill sends it to George, George sends it to Tom. And sooner or later, this person's whole life has been seen by all of these other people. It's never reported. Um, nobody ever knows about it because the auditing of these systems is incredibly weak. The fact that your private images, records of your private lives, records of your intimate moments have been taken from your private communication stream, from the intended recipient, and given to the government without any specific authorization, without any specific need, is itself a violation of your rights. Why is that in a government database? And you saw instances of that happening? Absolutely, yeah. Numerous? Or? It's routine enough, uh, depending on sort of the company you keep, it could be more or less frequent. Um, but these are seen as sort of the fringe benefits of surveillance positions. You, you say the audit, auditing is not that good that it would pick up on the sharing of that kind of material. A 29-year-old walked in and out of the NSA with all of their private records. What does that say about their auditing? The, there's something particularly about this area of life where almost nobody understands it. When we first sat down with the documents, I got some very, very good reporters who were in their sort of 50s and 60s who had done you know, endless great stories. Uh, and at some points, they just they literally couldn't understand what they were looking at. And it took the sort of 25-year-old <laughs> who would say, look, there's a great story there. And, and I would say, why is that a great story? If you're a, an MP and you're in your late 60s and you've spent your whole life thinking about economics or politics or farming, the notion that you could you even understand what questions to ask. That's probably the the single most important factor that explains the failures and oversight that we've seen in almost every Western government. We need to think of it in terms of literacy because uh, technology is a new system of uh, communication. It's a new set of symbols that people have to intuitively understand. It's like something that you learn, but just like how you learn to write letters in school, you know, you learn to use computers, how they interact, how they communicate. And technical literacy in our society is a, 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 a rare and precious resource. Are you confident that if you went back to the US and were tried in front of a jury of your peers that you would be acquitted? You know, I, I think it would be very difficult to find any 12 Americans in the United States right now who would uniformly agree that the last year's revelations about the NSA's unconstitutional surveillance programs did not serve the public interest. Um, I'm not going to presume to know what a jury would think uh, or to say what they should or should not think. But I think it's fair to say that there are reasonable and enduring questions about the extent of these surveillance programs, how they should be applied, and that should be the focus of any trial.